So because you, you know, but, but I, I, one has to be positive these days. Okay, you are a very negative person. Very negative. <laughs> All negative journalism happening these days. We 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 are experts at forgetting. I mean, riots, ho gaya, bhukmari, ho gayi, poverty, ho gaya. We 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 forgive, forget. We want to move on. So have we moved on? And the national lockdown in the first wave was instead of it being like a, a measure for the welfare of people, was in fact approached like a police-enabled curfew. Where are we headed in terms of the credibility of the media? Please can we not forget that we had channels that represented corona cases in a graphic depiction of a skull cap. After uh, print, after television, it will be digital next. So just take us through exactly where is the media landscape now heading? Uh, you know, I remember having to really fight for stories. Mm. Uh, and I know I sound like an old auntie who was saying, in my time we had to do this. <laughs> but hell, it's true. Barkha Dutt, the well-known journalist, well-connected couldn't get an ambulance in time. I'm not going to use the word controversial. That comes later. Yes. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. May I, 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 so I think it's a little ironic and it's a little interesting also to have somebody who's always been on camera grilling other people to have an interview, not grilling, just a conversation <laughs> with Barkha Dutt. Thank you so much, Barkha, uh, for joining us here on the Desh Bhakt. I'm, I'm a bit relieved you haven't come in your Desh Bhakt Aftar. <laughs> <laughs> the Bhakt Banerjee Aftar and I thought about it, but I'm like, no, that will be a little too much is because the topic is a little serious actually, Barkha. Uh, so I didn't want to degrade it and I did not want to trivialize it uh, because we're talking about a something which of course we've all been through i got personally hit with covid um so i have lived through this uh this is of course not only that part of the conversation but barkha that's new book humans of covid to hell and back is out now um and i really wanted to take this opportunity to have a conversation with her for many reasons um and let's start with some of the basic reasons and Barkha, trust me, you know, we put out the fact that we are going to have a conversation with you. There were so many other questions for you from our Discord community, our membership community. But I'll go to those questions in just a bit because first I want to just talk about the book. So let's start with talking about the book, Humans of COVID to Hell and Back. And I really, really, really appreciate the fact that first, in, I mean, right at the beginning of the book only, you're talking about the fact that this is about the human stories and not the numbers. Mm. Because as news people and as a former journalist myself, the first reaction to any news story is kitne gaye, kitne mare, kitne ka toll tha. So just take us through exactly first, what, what is this title and what is the intent of humans of COVID? Yeah, uh, thanks Akash. Uh, you know, in the course of reporting COVID for two years, I met so many people and the one overwhelming thing that I noticed about everybody, no matter how big the loss, how desperate they were, how sad they were, and sometimes how hopeful they were. Mm. What everybody had in common was this. Everybody that I met wanted to be acknowledged. It was a time when there was a lot of invisibilization of people, especially of the poor, but even of others. Everybody felt somewhat alone, somewhat orphaned, somewhat helpless, somewhat desperate. Yeah. And then there was the sense that maybe you would even die unnoticed. Maybe you would even die uncounted. Right. So for me, it was very important to not slip into the muscle memory of being a journalist and doing the data. And as you said, itna loss, itna death toll. Right. Ye hai dashboard pe figure. I had to train myself to say, no, I have to get out of this. These are real people. Then I have to tell their stories. And very early on in the book, I say what the book is not. This book is not a science book. This book is not a public health treatise. Mm. This book is not a book on statistics. There are much better books on that. This book is not even a book on government policy. This book is simply about the people of the pandemic, the people I met, what they felt, and through them to try and tell a story about India in these past two years. But for people, I have seen you do those coverage in the yeah. banks of the Ganga, and we've seen extensive coverage. Who's going to buy this book after having seen that sort of coverage? Why the book then? Is it a, a catharsis on your part? Or does it have something new for your avid viewers that mm -hmm. they will discover in this book? It's a very good question. And I remember when I was first thinking about a book and I said, you know, maybe people are tired of mm. COVID. Maybe there's a fatigue factor. And I could, I, and I know it because I lived <laughs> it as did we all for two years. But you know what? There is a thing called 
moving on without forgetting. I understand the human need mm. to pick up the pieces of life again. I understand the human need to emerge from the shadows of this pandemic. But I think there is an equally strong human need to chronicle a moment in history that we all witnessed. We were all witnesses to history in the making. True. We were all participants in it. We were all impacted by it. And this is our story. As I say, I think somewhere this is us. And if this is all of us, the people, and I don't make any grandiose claims about speaking for the people. I've mm. spoken for as many people as I met and I believe that many people will see shades of themselves in these stories. Uh, I think there is a kind of sense of a chronicle of our collective memory. And I think people care about chronicling their collective memory. Mm. And I also think that when news comes too fast and furious on a daily basis, you actually, it, it stacks up one on top of the other and sure. you forget it. You get numbed. You need to step back and actually look back at what happened to all of us. So this need to forget, I think somewhere down the line, we have done diplomas on this aspect. Mm. I mean, I got up from the second wave, badly battered. Mm. And I did an episode at that point of time. I hated myself for doing it. It was a Bhakt Banerjee episode where he said, give it three months, people will just forget it. Mm. Mm. When you're releasing this book yeah. and all your great effort at that point of time, and then you see the UP elections. Mm. Come on, honestly, does it even matter at this point of time? I mean, if your measurement of everything is whether people vote on that basis, mm. then, then we have to say very little matters. Because actually, I know, we don't know, but it doesn't, we don't fully understand after decades of being journalists, mm. what people vote for and what people vote against. That's the truth. We need some humility as journalists to say, we don't understand, boss. Whenever a journalist tries to forecast an election, she gets it wrong. So the one thing I've learned is I will not, I will not make any appraisal of what people vote on. Mm. But it was sad for me to see that among our people, there was more helpless resignation and fatalism mm. than there was anger. And in our poorest, most vulnerable people, there was greater sort of, you know, a kind of resigned acceptance of their invisibilization in the system than rage. Do I understand it? No, I don't understand it. But am I privileged? Am I, you know, am I completely from a different reality? With all my personal losses in this pandemic, losing my dad, I'm very privileged. So I understand that maybe I don't understand what sure. it feels like to live on the margins of a political system and an economic system and a social system. I'll come to the personal loss bit yeah. and, I, and, and, and that completely moved me also. Uh, but let's talk about the, the, the invisible uh, mm -hmm. factor and, and, and the brutalization, whether it be the bureaucracy, whether it be the police. We saw some of those visuals. Mm -hmm. Just take us through exactly how it was the failure of the system. I'm not even talking about the politics mm -hmm. here. The failure of the system. Is there no sh human sympathy or is it how our bureaucracy and the police force have been taught to deal with the less powerful and the privileged. I think the word you used is the absolute word. It's a brutalization. It's a numbing. You know, I will never forget. It's, 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 it's sometimes more than the enormous tragedies. It's sometimes a little vignettes of, 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 of something that you see that stay with you. Mm. And the national lockdown in the first wave was, instead of it being like a, a measure for the welfare of people, was in fact approached like a police-enabled curfew. Now, what that did was that for the already ravaged by poverty daily wager, who had suddenly lost her or his income, ability to pay rent, ability to feed children, and we saw the, the massive exodus of millions that took place, there was now a desperation to just live. Mm. And I remember outside one of the hospitals in the capital, seeing a man, ironically, that's why they say truth is so much more dramatic than fiction, sitting on the ground against a yellow police barricade and weeping. And I went up to him and he was just weeping. And he was a rickshaw driver who had, obviously the rickshaws weren't flying, there was no public transport, our public transport was shut in the first wave. And he had walked to the wholesale market to try and get subsidies on it for a cheaper price. Mm. And because he had violated the lockdown, he'd been thrashed by the police and then deposited by the police at the gates of this hospital, which was not attending to anybody but COVID patients. So he was sitting there weeping. And his name was Manoj. And I remember that just staying with me as the image of this kind of brutalization, where it's not that the police at the front line, the ordinary constable was not suffering himself, but mm. there's an element, or, you know, mm. with, with exposure. Let's also acknowledge that. The policeman 
at the barricade in the middle of COVID was a frontline warrior. He was also exposing himself to danger. He's also not necessarily very well paid. Mm. But that sort of authority of the Lati, that sort of numbing process that comes with this brutalization, um, that really stood out in the first wave, Akash. And on the other hand, you've dedicated an entire chapter to the first responders. So, right now the first draft, but when the final draft would be written about this dark period, mm -hmm. do you then say that while the police and the bureaucracy are coming across in a very bad light, um, the doctors are the ones who would shine out? Why I, an entire chapter on them? I want to say something about the bureaucracy. I feel that there is a difference between the system and the assembly, you know, how power is assembled structurally in this country, which is what we really learned in COVID. Mm. And what individual bureaucrats suddenly set free from an over-centralized system could do. Okay. There were also some bureaucrats who were really stellar. There was stellar. And I remember this woman I met in Dharwad in Karnataka. You know, and for everybody who's like, oh, these people are just BJP bashers. This is a this is a BJP-led state. This has nothing to do with BJP Congress. She was just a bureaucrat who impressed me. And she managed to stem the exodus of workers from her state. And I asked her, how did you do it? And she said, the first thing I did was, I took over all the youth hostels mm. in the city and I gave all the workers places to stay. She said, then I felt it wasn't enough to treat them as these people who were being put into this homeless shelter type thing. They had to be dignity. Of course, they had to be food and they had to be, you know, all of that, but they had to be dignity. So she got clothes. I don't know how she did it, but she got clothes stitched for them and she gave them clothes and she said, maybe they, were, they didn't stay for the clothes, but for me, I was, it was an expression of dignifying yeah. what they were going yeah. through. I'm just giving this as an example to say they were individual bureaucrats. I remember another woman who came carrying her newborn baby to work in one of the southern states. I, don't, I forget now it was Kerala. I remember Nandurbar in Maharashtra where the district collector in anticipation of the second wave at a very hyper local level creates uh, oxygen plants, mm, yes. sanctions oxygen, his, his, his little funds for oxygen plants and therefore has a better uh, managed second wave than many other districts. So when we say bureaucracy, there are individuals who manage to break through the system. The second point, uh, but you, you say even by doctors. The, yeah, because I, I'm just juxtaposing this is that you have to put that asterisk and say there were a few. But when, we, when you look at the doctors as, 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 a, as a class of people, would you say that as a profession, it stood out? Doctors, nurses, ward staff, um, orderlies in the hospital, security staff. I mean, there were people, mm. uh, I met sanitation workers who walked, who would walk several kilometers every day to get to work because public transport was the way it was in the first wave. Uh, yes, I think they did. I think I met doctors who actually volunteered, who volunteered even though infectious diseases was not their speciality. And you know, mm. I'll tell you what it reminded me of because I'm so old. I remember covering the Kargil war and meeting these 20 something soldiers who were the backbone of India's military response. They were two years, three years younger than I was at the time. This time I was reminded of that 20 something generation because the resident doctors, all the resident doctors in public hospitals yes. were these 20 something foot soldiers of the pandemic. They weren't the fancy people that you saw on television in prime time, but they were the foot soldiers, they were the mm. backbone and their life was nothing but just completely overwhelmed and consumed and especially those in the government hospitals who don't earn pots of money and never will earn pots of money. Of course we have to acknowledge them. The virus as an equalizing force leaping across the divides of class, caste and gender is also the biggest lie of our times. Mm -hmm. Explain. When this pandemic started, the cliche was that the virus is the great equalizer. Mm. Corona doesn't distinguish between class, caste, religion, gender. It distinguished between all of these. All of these. Think about it. If you, if you were at the bottom of the social or economic hierarchy, the way you experienced this pandemic was just so much more grave and helpless and, 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 and ravaging to your sense of, of security than it was if you were relatively privileged. It does not mean that we, the middle class, upper middle class, wealthy, privileged elite did not suffer. Many mm. of our class too experienced huge losses. But even in that loss, we were cognizant that it's not the loss of 
a municipal ward sweeper who sold everything he had to pay the hospital bill for his wife to be treated who was in her 30s who then dies not from covid but because the oxygen runs out in the hospital or the state never even acknowledges mm. that so it's just different it is different being that worker who walked 1000 kilometers or 700 kilometers or 400 kilometers it is different being ram pukar who's walking home and gets a phone call on the way to say his toddler child has died before he can reach yes. and then think because we don't want to think right we want to forget but then please think of the image of the chapati on the railway track in aurangabad where workers rest to spend the night and a good train runs over them i know we don't want to remember yes. but we have to so i won't lie to you um when i was reading the chapter father and daughters uh, i had tears in my eye uh, i'm not i'm not going to deny the fact that it is perhaps because of my personal lived experience mm. also is because perhaps i mean as journalists yeah. one has gone into many places and dantewada in 2611 and all that jazz but lying in bed for 12 days high fever infection in the lung for the first time you think that oh will i survive this um and i think the worst fear mm. for a child is being helpless in front of their parents when they are not well and 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 that 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 thing about you not being able to get your father there in time and the rickety ambulance how did it come to that barkha that the well known journalist well connected couldn't get an ambulance in time couldn't it was panic and that's why the guilt i could have waited for the hospital's ambulance to get free the hospital's ambulance was doing some rounds mm. and the hospital said we could send the ambulance in a few hours and my sense of panic my sense of feeling to, you know like i needed to do something mm. took over me and i feel that i made the wrong decision because a cousin of mine said i know somebody who runs a, has a private runs a private ambulance here's the number we called the number the guy said ha hey i said please send and then when the guy arrived i was too minded because i saw a maruti van instead of an ambulance i saw a single oxygen uh, cylinder i saw no paramedics it was two phattas as we call them two strips of leather beaten seats at the back it was just a repurposed van and i was like should i do this and then i panicked i panicked i thought wrongly mm. that if i rush him to hospital the sooner i get him to hospital the better, better. it will be I look back now and I think that it was the wrong decision. So to your point Barkhada the well connected Barkhada the well connected was able to get a bed in in in, in by calling a doctor you know by by saying please please sir please mm. um which I know that the people that I had reported on outside the closed gates of hospitals were not able to do. So I have to acknowledge there that I was not those people. Yeah. I was able to get that bed and actually my father was supposed to go into a general room initially he was not considered ill enough to necessarily need the icu and it's because i took him in that ambulance where the cylinder saturation did not work as it was meant to that his oxygen levels fell and when they fell the emergency ward said he has to go to an icu bed and then the icu bed wasn't free because they had actually freed up another room for him and then i again had to say please sir and then he was taken and of course it was panic i i do not say i was an invisible product of the indian state who couldn't get an ambulance mm. i was a panicked daughter who made a misjudgment i think i'll never know but i think does it not bother you that all of this is a non story at this point of time do you think it is a story i mean uh, because i con con continuously say that we 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 are experts at forgetting i mean riots ho gaya bhukmari ho gayi poverty ho gaya we 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 forgive forget we want to move on so have we moved on because omicron third wave also people were super confident roaming around look it's a really tough question because there have been times when people have told me why are you still reporting on covid who cares <laughs> nobody cares Why are you still doing this? Why are you writing this book? Everybody, I have friends who have told me why did you write this book? Why? I don't agree with this. I I I I I believe that the instinct to forget unpleasant things is a human instinct, but there is an equally powerful human instinct to chronicle collective memory. Hmm. If this was just my story or your story, I think that, you know even then there would have been you know I would have felt I wanted to write my story and your story. but this is not this is a story of our country 
this is our country's story. It might be also similar or dissimilar in some ways to other countries in the world. Mm. But this is the biggest story as journalists that we were called to report on in our lifetime. For us to not chronicle, step back and chronicle this and put the different jigsaw pieces together into some narrative form for posterity is a grandiose word, mm. but just for the next few years at least. Maybe people don't want to read it now because there's a too muchness. Maybe they'll read it after two months. Maybe they'll read it after three months. Maybe they'll read it after a year. Mm. But this book, I believe that this people will see themselves. This is their their book. This is this is the book for you know of everybody. I try to not leave out anybody I met. Okay, okay. So, Barkha, that's humans of COVID to hell and back. The book is out now. Uh, have a look at it. I mean. Anyways, there were some parts that really touched me. I want to move into something more yeah. um, happier. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to use the word controversial. That comes later. Yes. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. May I, 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 uh, the last time we had a conversation was mm -hmm. 2015, when you were making that gradual transition out of mainstream television. You had become a consulting editor at that yes. point of time in NDTV. Um, how has that journey been from the most recognized face on television to now a completely child of the digital mm -hmm. generation? You know, it hasn't been uh, an easy journey. It was tough uh, to completely accept that I was ready to leave television. So it's like actually, um, I would I would draw a parallel with leaving a bad relationship. Uh, you know, you know you need to leave, uh, and you keep making excuses to stay. Uh, you keep making excuses for a partner where you know it's not working, and for yourself, it's not just the partner. Mm. Um, it could be a toxic relationship. It could be a relationship that's done its time. It could be a relationship that doesn't have the zing anymore. It could be a combination of all of these. It's a, it's it's a good parallel because sometimes we stay on in relationships much longer than we should, um, even when we know in our heart of hearts that it's over. I think the big mistake that I made is that I took too long to leave. As happens in a relationship. As happens in a relationship as well. I took too long to leave TV. I was also astonished, frankly, to discover that after my differences as, as they were with NDTV, um, you know, I, I, I found that the climate in the industry was such that it wasn't actually easy to migrate from one TV channel to another. In my mind, initially, I thought I'd do a show somewhere mm. and then I'd build up this digital company. But that's not how it panned out. Uh, I did a very ill-advised experiment with television uh, in the interim, one that I really do want to forget. Uh, it was a mistake. And it took me time to acknowledge that this was done for me. This was done for me and I needed to be brave enough to recognize that it was done for me and that if I didn't do this, mm. I was going to be stale, you know, just that, that I was going to be so stale. I get asked this question, so I'll ask you this. If you get an opportunity, would you go back to television? In today's in, uh, television in India? Only if there was somebody who was interested in partnering uh, me on my content. Would I give up my space? Would I give up Mojo and go on television? No. Okay. But if somebody came to me and said, hey, we really like what you do on your platform. Can we also duplicate it? Can we also amplify it on our platforms? You know, your interviews, can we run the Mojo Story interviews on our TV? I'm not going to say, no, mm -hmm. TV is so impure, you know, or, you know, I do. <laughs> you do, we the women, can we be a te te television partner? Mm. Happy to. Uh, but give this up, my corner, my space, reporting as I want to on my terms, however difficult and daunting it is, never. Okay, so we'll get to the <clears throat> casual sexism part of it. <laughs> but before that, yeah. you know, I find it amazing when I look at the TV uh, digital scape at this point of time and I see how young women are going ahead and reporting from, I mean, you are of course an example, but in terms of following, whether it be Hathras or whether it be mm -hmm. other things also, would you say that at least in terms of digital media, the gender gap is a little lesser or, or the, the, powers and, uh, mm -hmm. the powers that be are still being controlled by the men? Great question. I think boots on ground, the gap is much less than... Uh, you know, I remember having to really fight for stories. Mm. Uh, and I know I sound like an old auntie who was saying, in my time we had to do this. <laughs> but 
Hell, it's true. Uh, so boots on the ground, the gap has lessened. Management ownership, where is it lessened? Please mm. show me. Please show me which media organization. Yes, there's. Uh, I'm thinking off the top of my head. I can think of Faye. I, I can think of Faye, who's a kind of you know solo entrepreneur. But mostly, when you think of organizations that have been now assembled as organizations, mm. mostly it's still men running them. Mostly it's still men raising money for them. I just think across media there isn't enough proprietorship. Uh, and women, you know, and management roles for women. Mm. And frankly, even editorially, yes, I think now you have the Times Group and NDTV that 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 are editorially run by women. But I would, I'm just saying this off the top of my head. But I'm imagining 80% newsrooms are still run by men. I'm imagining 80% CEOs are men. I'm imagining it. I'm imagining. When I say I'm imagining, I'm saying I'm I'm not really calculating, but impressionistic appraisal is that that would be true for digital world as well. You recently had a conversation at the Harvard India Summit also, mm -hmm. uh, reimagining the media landscape, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong. So, so then how is this going to be reimagined? We know that media traditionally has been in the hands of a few people. Then, of course, that can be controlled by the political class. But in the digital sphere, where it was getting de democratized, we are seeing again the clampdown on digital also mm -hmm. story coming in. I'm and glad I you keep, brought that up. Yeah. And I keep repeating it is because can we at least talk about something that we are seeing that is going to happen for sure is that after uh, print, after television, it will be digital next. So just take us through exactly where is the media landscape now heading? So I think that it is a compliment, twisted as it may be, to all of us in the digital space, you as a satirist, me as a digital uh, storyteller, um, and so many others of our colleagues in this space, the startup digital content space, that clearly this is the next space that is likely to be under siege. Mm. And, I, and I use those words carefully, but under siege is the phrase that I would use. The new proposed content guidelines, while being challenged in court, are designed to choke independent small media, are designed to choke people who don't have wealthy access to a battery of lawyers at all times. Is it a compliment to our relevance? Yes. But does it really pose a challenge to our capacity to keep fighting back? Yeah. Of course it does. And, and I keep saying to people, it is so fashionable to crib nonstop about the media. But if people don't feel invested in the media as something that concerns them, this fight is over and it's lost. So one has seen you, for example, do this whole reporting thing, the anchoring thing. We all know about the We The People. It's, yeah. And now this sort of editor, entrepreneur. So what's the preferred role? Reporter, anchor, editor, <laughs> entrepreneur. I'd always pick reporter. If you asked me all my life, nobody understood this about me, even in my years at NDTV. Like if you told me, we're giving you a choice between being a reporter and being a prime time presenter. I probably am the only person I know who would pick reporter. Hmm. Um, because it just makes me feel alive in a different way. I recognize that the hierarchies we have assembled in our mediascape uh, privilege the anchor privilege the editor, mm. um, certainly privilege the entrepreneur and the, and the CEO, if you can manage to make a success out of that. But first love, always report. But at that same point of time, you have a situation where in the But yeah, it's a good but. Because you know what? If I were an employee today, I would not have been allowed by any organization I worked for to sit in a car and just leave for 120 days and drive 30,000 kilometers. If that was the joy of being able to weld Correct. being a reporter with being an independent entrepreneur. I'm sure they wouldn't have allowed it. Yeah. Um, on, on the contrary, you would have been called names. For example, Akhilesh Yadav, in a very polite way in an interview, says to a female anchor, Are aap to imandar patrakar mm -hmm. hai. And then she goes in a fit of rage. Mm -hmm. Being called an imandar patrakar today is an insult. So, where are we headed in terms of the credibility of the media? You know, Barkha, would you advise, for example, any family member of yours, if she says auntie, um, whatever. But um, I hope she doesn't say auntie. Oh, I'm just. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I know. What, if, what would I say? Would you tell a family member that, no, go ahead, join media. It's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to be a journalist. I would not encourage anyone to join TV. And I, it breaks my heart to say this because I am a child of television. I love the visual medium. I love visual storytelling. I love the technical parts of it. But Indian TV news, which created me, 
um, and I loved it for so many years. Today, please can we not forget while we're in the business of forgetting that we had channels that used a hashtag called Corona Jihad at the height of the pandemic. Please can we not forget that we had channels that represented Corona cases in a graphic depiction of a skull cap. Please can we pause to remember these things. And, and the other thing is that I do believe that journalism has become this sort of gentrified profession which I'm not comfortable with. I don't, I don't believe that journalists should not be paid fairly, so mm. that's not what I mean. But I always tell young people that if you, if this doesn't excite you, please don't do it. Please don't do it. But so many people do it because they imagine it to be some glamorous job where they'll get to be famous. No. But you know what? This is what we've reduced television news to. However, can we take a moment to acknowledge that there are heroes in journalism? Stringers. Stringers, that word stringers, you know, we, itself, is, itself is such a bad word. Yeah. But what do we mean by that? We mean hyper local contributors who freelance in small towns, villages and give, they're the feeder network of every big media house, every small media house. Um, language press. Wow. Second wave, Dainik Bhaskar, Gujarat Samachar. Wow. Sterling classic journalism, it still lives. True. Okay, now let's get to the favorite part, uh, controversial part. Okay, so 2015, I interview you, you get the Emmy nomination at that point of time. Yes. 2021, we are sitting, I just saw on your Twitter handle, South Asian Digital Media Awards, you've got a gold there. Uh, so I, I interview at good points of time. <laughs> um, but okay, let's yeah. let's start with that the, 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 the whole controversial bit. Yeah. So there was, for people who don't know, they can see the scroll interview, it's, it's <laughs> listed below. You had a very serious problem to be referred to as controversial mm -hmm, journalist. Mm -hmm. I want to know, six years down the line, do you still worry about what people are tagging you as? I, you know what, I didn't even worry then. And just for context, Akash did an interview with me, where he did this long interview and I was AMA, asked me anything, which I still am. Uh, we do no pre-scripted, just for context, no questions were discussed ahead of this interview. Oh, arm wala question? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, my objection is this. I've got male colleagues in this industry uh, who have had at least as many controversies as me, if, 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 if not more. You will never see copy subliminally saying controversial journalist XX and XX or XX. But when it comes to me and I want to ask, is it because I'm female? Is this subliminal sexism or what else is it? Correct. Because it, that's all I'm calling out. I. No, I irritate people because, precisely because I don't care. I don't mold myself to their approval of me. I don't mold myself after their criticism of me. So I'm aware of that. But and I'm aware also that I don't fit neatly, unlike many of our, some of our colleagues, not many, some of our colleagues into this or that camp. Mm. And that can be a kind of lonely path to furrow. But I was irritated when you did that. I don't know if you did that or scrolls editors did that. I was irritated because I was like, listen, the day you start referring or prefacing my male colleagues in the same way, I'm cool. True. True. That's, that, that was the point. Huh? No, the reason why I'm asking that tag yes. is because believe you me, when I put this question out to our audiences um, on our Discord server, these are hardcore as I call them Tesh Bhats. they really really want to question everything there half the time they're questioning me amongst the other questions that you've heard right now a very common thread was also but no but but has she completely you know explained her story as far as Cargill was concerned because you continuously get those mm. uh, sound bites that are still I asked you this question is would you after so many years still bother clarifying Ki yaar, army ne bol diya tha. The same Iridium phones the army was also using. How many times would you then go ahead and clarify? Or would you write a book or something like that? No, ever? I don't answer it anymore. You know, when I was younger, uh, or, you know, at the time that you interviewed me, which was many years ago, I would say, you know, but General Malik wrote it in his book. He was the army chief. Does the troll know more than the army chief? And it would really bother me because it was such scurrilous crap. Today, I do not respond to it. Hmm. I still get trolled in this way and I say I have nothing to say on this. This is a waste of time. Let's bring up the other, I don't even know if it's the elephant in the room, radia tapes. I have never felt so vindicated on anything as I do on that issue. Everyone knows my position and again I'm not going to waste time because it's chronicled, documented, available for anybody to see. But I want to take it one step further today. You've got journalists cribbing about privacy. You've got journalists shouting from the rooftops about WhatsApp messages being intercepted but then using in other contexts when it's not their own phone calls, other people's WhatsApp messages and putting them out there. 
boss, we need to have an honest conversation about whether we believe in privacy or we don't believe in privacy. Right? And what public interest is this that determines when we get into the issue and when we don't? I feel all of these journalists making so much noise about their privacy being violated today, so many did, mm. were at the forefront of name calling other journalists whose conversations were on those tapes. I'm bringing this up today only to make the point that I feel zero, when I say zero, zero defensiveness about any of these issues. I am defensive about. Ask me what I really care about. I care about doing a mediocre show. I care when my homework is shallow. Mm. I care when my question doesn't come out as sensitively as it ought to have to a grieving family. I care when I sound shriller than I ought to have. I care when I haven't broken a story. I don't care about this concocted crap that has questioned my integrity or my, you know, sort of basically a kind of question of my good faith. Those I don't engage with anymore. Those I don't respond to anymore. And I'm not even getting into the whole uh, murky business as far as the tapes are concerned because that's old No, but I'm saying, look at where we are on that yeah. debate today on privacy. I'm just yeah. making that ironic point. I, but I've just... said so much about it, like there's really literally nothing more to say. But on a corollary point to that, w did it matter to you mm -hmm. on who really got up in this self-righteous indignation? Mm -hmm. I'm asking you this is because I faced it myself. Mm -hmm. This whole cancel culture yeah. that I am fairer than you. Oh, I am impartial, so I have to now call you out. The kind of people, the kind of publications that were at the forefront. Yeah. Would that have mattered to you? I'm only asking this because in the reference, I'll tell you one tweet of mine where people might not get the sarcasm is equal to my entire 10 years of Twitter history being deleted and being called out for. Oh, yeah, I'm so glad you've asked this because it's the one thing that I actually raised. That's why I made this point about the ironies of the same sort of self-righteous journalists now crying foul on you know, finding themselves at the other end of, 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 of their conversations being put out in the public domain. Humbug, hmm. humbug uh, is, a, is a great malaise of our times. And I have to say that some of our colleagues are not exempt from that. And if there was one thing that continues to irritate me, it's not what other people think of me, but hypocrisy gets to me. And hypocrisy when accompanied by a sense of moral superiority really gets to me and mm. I am not comfortable I'm not comfortable with cancel culture I know it's a complex debate yeah. I know it's a complex debate but I just feel like we talk so much about free speech but what about free thought are we thinking freely or are we being asked to choose sides in echo chambers where our minds are not growing true true fair enough fair enough so I, I, I just wanted to put that yeah. uh, okay um, just a last one or two questions so I understand that you do have, you know, a problem with uh, tags, subliminal uh, sexism. I just want to know, after so many years of doing what you do, now transitioning into digital, what's the, what's the play? What, what, what is it that you would then want to be known for? My journalism. That's it, plain, simple. It's, it's so, I think I have a body of work. Hmm. I think my body of work speaks for itself. I think like everybody else, who around the world, I've had imperfections in my work. Uh, I've had work that's ranged from the excellent to the mediocre. Uh, but I want to be known for my excellence in journalism. Uh, and I want to be remembered for the excellent bits more than the mediocre bits. Mm. And of course the mediocre bits were there. How could they not be? I've been in this profession for 25 or 24 years. How could I never have had mediocre moments? <laughs> So then let me, in that sense only, then ask you for people who, you know, there are a lot of genuine people who want to know, yeah. you know, one or two things that get my goat. Tell us what we should watch. Tell us your opinion. It's some of the people, I mean, I think that I have been stupid. No, no, why should I tell you what your opinion should be? You make your own opinion. I'm only giving yeah. you the facts here. Yeah. So going forward, what's the play for Mojo? Yeah. Are you going to give your opinion so that people can say, oh, achha, that is what I'm supposed to believe. Are you going to give them facts? Are you give them, how are you going to cushion it? So, because, you know, you know Bata, it, it, one has to be positive these days. Okay, you are a very negative person. Very negative. <laughs> all negative journalism happening these days. How do you balance all of this? Today, you can't talk about Kashmir, for example. You've spent so many years reporting on Kashmir. Today, you can't freely even talk about it because there is no both sides. There is only one side of the Kashmir yeah. debate now mm -hmm. uh, what's the play the play is I tried briefly flirted with opinion what are called vlogs 
and it actually failed. With my audience, it failed. And I know why it failed, because that's not my core competence. My core competence is not to stand up, look at a camera and tell people what to think. It's not my skill. My skill is to tell a good story, to do a good interview, to bring complex issues and distill them, you know, into a simple, accessible, doesn't mean not deeply researched, but deeply researched, but tell the story mm -hmm. simply. Um, th those are my skills. And I, that continues to be what I want to build Mojo on. I also have in my, in my book, just briefly going on to it, a, me a Mia Kalpa moment that being a television journalist for so long made me lazy had staled me out and made me lose connection with a lot of issues which I want to bring back into the mainstream of reportage, right? People, you know, what, what is loosely called people's issues, issues that matter to people, instead of the navel gazing that all of us are so guilty of, ki, you know, we get caught in our, we get caught sometimes in conversations that, that only like the 150 of us care about. And, and we don't hear, because we only live in those, in that universe of 150, we don't hear things outside of that 150, or we feel somehow less than if we cover those issues, or we feel soft news people if we cover them. Come on, it's, it's, I think I want to mainstream reporting, uh, analysis, interviews, great conversation. I don't want to do Tutu Meme debates, and I don't want to tell people what to think. There are better, more accomplished people who can be the, you know, the, the sage guiding lights of our, of our opinion universe. I'm not one of them. I'm just a reporter. Final question. Are people still open to hearing hard facts? Are people still open hmm. to probing journalism? Or is that a dying breed minority? It's a very, very difficult space to be in. But one thing I found in COVID is that even people... It changed over the course of the pandemic, but there were phases in this pandemic when it didn't matter which way people leaned politically. The human dimension of what was happening moved them. Mm. The, you know, you had people who were right-wing uh, supporters reaching out to left-wing activists on Twitter for oxygen. Those cross connections across political trenches were made. And I found even in the journalism that one was doing, if the story powerfully transcended these polarities of where you are on the right or the left, people responded to it irrespective, that still gives me hope. There is hope, of course, of course. Barkha, that's humans of COVID to hell and back her travels and something that we should remember beyond the first draft of history also. I think the point is that people should be able to read this, if not immediately, maybe years as well down the line. So to that aspect, it's, a, it's an important piece of work. Do go and get it if you uh, can. Thank you so much, Bhagavad, for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.